Good afternoon, my name's Brett Sahara and I'm the National Landcare Facilitator and welcome to part two of the National Landcare webinar series on regenerating Australia's soil health. I've also got Simon Gould from Soils for Life with me who's uh, helping us as a partner in this series of webinars. Uh, you'll notice that uh, hopefully we've learned a few things based on your feedback from last week. To begin with, we've got the image uh, right way around this week. Uh, we've also got the questions and full list of answers from last week's webinar up on our respective websites as well as the uh, presentations and a recording from last week's webinar. And uh, we'd like to thank everyone for their feedback last week. The format this week, based on uh, a lot of the feedback we've had, is we've uh, now got two presenters this week and we're trying to have an extended Q&A session at the end, so the presentations will be each around about 15 minutes, and then we're moving to a 20-minute uh, Q&A session. You'll notice at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, there is the chat box uh, where you can type in your questions. We'll get to as many of those as we can during the Q&A session, uh, but any of those that we don't, uh, you, we will get a full response to all of the questions to people, uh, hopefully within a week. If you have any problems uh, with today's recording, please uh, call Redback on 1800 733 416. If you're having any audio issues, there is a toll-free number on 1800 896 323 with the pin 2971 4965 and the details are also on your screen. You can also, if you like, participate on Twitter or at hashtag SoilHealth. And I'd like to hand over to Simon Gould, thank you. All right. So uh, in Brett describing how we're doing things today, you'll know uh, that we won't be able to include Graham Hand in the presentation, but Graham has uh, kindly given us access to um, a podcast where he gave a very detailed um, discussion period uh, about what he does and some of his lessons. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that, and that was tweeted out last week. Um, and we look forward, hopefully, to having Graham available perhaps in later land care uh, webinars during, during the year. And we've just been reminded by Rhonda Daly that uh, the Source for Life team were in the Women's Weekly today, so uh, get out there and have a look at uh, some of the great stories of the women out there doing what they do in the landscape, supporting uh, the great work that farmers do around Australia. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, we've had over... 600 people registered for today's webinar, so thank you very much for your participation. We've got two questions we'd like, poll questions we'd like you to um, participate in before we start off. Could we have the first of those questions, please? And what the first one is, is for those who have already made uh, the change into actively managing their soil health, we'd like to get some feedback as to what practice changes did you make uh, on your property? So just type on the square uh, that most uh, reflects your answer. We'll just hold that there for a moment. Then another 30 seconds or so. You can see the real time results coming up on your screen there. So it really is the, the practice that you've introduced uh, on your property. Right, we might close that one off there, thanks, uh, and move on to the second question. And this is really for uh, those people that are saying, um, we're, we're still thinking about this, uh, but we're, we're keen to make some change. Which practice change uh, are you most interested in either applying on your property or getting some more information on? Again, just tick on the, uh, which one or a number of those that, most, that interest you. Getting a little bit of feedback from one or two people. There's a bit of background music. Um, not sure where that's coming from, but uh, we'll try and get the operator to fix that if it's coming from our end. Thank you. Right, we might close that one off. Thank you. And uh, I'll get Simon to introduce the first of our speakers, please. So we've got two great speakers today. The first is uh, uh, Cole Sykes, 
Uh, Cole's been well known to many people around Australia for his innovations with pasture cropping and we've asked Cole to speak to that. But the interesting thing is that Cole is so busy and so in demand, he's actually dialling in from Mareeba uh, outside of Cairns where he's speaking at a, car, uh, a carbon soil carbon forum up there at the moment. So we're very grateful that Cole can break from his commitments up there to join us on what we think is going to be a great presentation on how he introduced change on his landscape, in particular the benefits and techniques, etc., associated with improving soil health. So, Cole, um, thanks for dialling in from North Queensland. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm going to talk, mate, well, as Simon said, about uh, what I did on my farm and why, and, and why I changed and how. What I'm talking about is a method I've, I've used and developed on my farm. It's certainly not the only way of, of improving soils and soil health, so we don't need to get necessarily stuck on one technique. But um, just uh, next slide, slide please, Simon. Um, now, in, I have a property called Winona, um, which is about 300 k's north, northwest of Sydney, um, Central Tablelands, New South Wales, a couple of thousand acres. It's granite soil, certainly not heavy soil. And interestingly, the pH now is 6. It used to be in the low 5s so, and even lower than that 20 or 30 years ago. Next slide. Um, the enterprises that I have on the place now is we're basically cheap producers or wool producers, 18 micron wool, run about 4,000 merino sheep, or that's mainly ewes. We also grow about a quarter of the place to crops, um, and that can vary a lot from wheat, oats, cereal, rye. Um, that's all pasture crops. No, I don't use any other method at all. Um, we do a bit of cattle trading when there's some surplus feed. At the moment there's not much because a bit like much of Australia, we, we haven't had a lot of rain lately. We also run one of the largest kelpie studs in the world, sell, sell dogs all over the world. Another enterprise that, that has developed because of my change of man management is harvesting and, and selling native grass seed. We actually, from a financial point of view, we, we, uh, we generate more income from native grass seed than we do from selling wheat. Um, next slide. Now, in um, in the 1930s, well, to start with, my family, my family settled on, the, on this in this area in the 1860s. My great grandfather settled there then. Um, but in my in the 1930s, my, my father started growing wheat in, in a fairly big way, and um, in that era, he didn't require any pesticides and only a very small amount of superphosphate to grow good crops. Now. No one seems to be able to do that now. There's got to be a reason why. So why can't we do that now? If my father could do it in the 1930s on this same country, why, why can't it be done now? And really the answer is, if our farms have healthy functioning carbon-rich soil instead of dysfunctional soil, and I might add that most of the soils now all around Australia are dysfunctional, they weren't originally. Most of our, our soils, as some of the, the, the data shows, or the information shows from the, the 1840s, shows that much of our soils in Australia were very fertile. So if our farms had healthy, function, healthy functioning carbon-rich soil instead of dysfunctional soil, we would then need less fertiliser. We would have far better a water holding capacity on our soils. So by improving the soil, and we will also increase, increase crop and pasture yields and reduce costs. Now, if we go the other, other way and, and look at this, if, if our farms had pastures that functioned like grasslands, we would have healthy functioning carbon-rich soil and we would require less fertiliser, less insecticides and less fungicides to, to uh, be able to, to run our farms. So why did I change? Next slide, uh, Simon. I missed out on a few of those slides, sorry. Why did I change? I grew up in high input agriculture, as in my, my father um, changed uh, his, his methods um, in the 1940s and 50s and started the sub-super uh, regime that was very popular around that era, and it worked very well. So I grew up in high input agriculture. It's what I knew. But during the 1970s, the cost of production was becoming so high, it was difficult to be profitable. We, we were starting to hit a wall in the 1970s. But, next slide, Simon, um, 
1979, we had a major bushfire which totally destroyed Winona. That's house, sheds, 3,000 sheep, all the fencing. Um, we just had a, a black 2,000 acres, totally burnt out, dead sheep everywhere. So I had no money. I had to find out a way of surviving on Winona without spending any money at all. So I started looking at, which was almost heresy at the time, low input or almost no input agriculture and looked at a way of developing that. But we often look at, at uh, low input agriculture as low production agriculture and it certainly doesn't have to be. So how did I change? I, I looked for low input agriculture. Uh, uh, next slide, Simon. Um, stop using pasture fertiliser. We were using equivalent to $40,000 or $50,000 worth of superphosphate on our place at this time up until this fire. So stop using pasture fertiliser and pesticides. I focused on 100% ground cover in everything, crops and pastures. I started time control grazing in 1990 and developed pasture cropping in, 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 in 1995, which I'll talk about in a minute. I focused on restoring my own to a grassland is, is really where my focus was. Next slide, slide, Simon. This bottle of beer here is very relevant because over many beers, Daryl Clough and myself <laughs> developed the pasture cropping technique one evening. It was a bit of a lunatic idea, and, and I go often I use it most of my talks. So it, you have to be drunk to think of something so stupid as, as being able to sow crops into grassland. Next slide, Simon. Pasture cropping is land management technique where annual crops are zero tilled into dormant perennial grass or grassland. But it's a fair bit more than that. It's not quite that, that, that straightforward. Pasture cropping could also be called perennial cover cropping. And that's how I introduced the, the, the subject of pasture cropping to the Americans when I was over there last year. They understand cover cropping and pasture cropping is actual, actually perennial cover cropping. Now, next slide. So pasture cropping technique, and we need to remember that pasture cropping it really should be combined with good grazing management to, for, to, to work well. We, we should never have taken animals out of cropping land. It's one of the worst things we have ever done. Um, we need animals in there to keep to, for nutrient cycling and many, many other benefits, not to mention uh, profit. But pasture cropping will produce crops for grain and or grazing. It will improve pastures by stimulating perennial grass, grass species and species diversity. It will improve soil health and increase soil organic carbon, and it will improve ecological function. And while we're on ecological function, most of the problems we have in agriculture, like crop diseases, uh, insect attack, uh, infertile dysfunctional soils, um, uh, lack, lack of, of, of water in soils, are actually not agricultural problems, but they're ecological problems. We need to, to readdress so many of these questions we ask about agriculture and focus on ecology or ecological function to answer those questions. So next, next slide, please. Over a 12-month period, a paddock that has been pasture cropped will produce grazing of grassland pre sowing the crop. We, we, we've still got all that grazing that we normally we have in, in a grazing enterprise. So we're grazing the crop pre sowing and mulching, uh, using the animals to mulch and manure the paddock pre-sowing. We get grazing of, of the crop, in, in crop, like most many crops are. We get grain from the crop. We can get grazing of the grassland after harvest. If you, if you relate that to a, a, a cropping program, none of that grazing is in there. We then harvest native grass seed off these areas. Now, all that's done with reduced fertiliser. We, we now uh, uh, have reduced fertiliser by, by 70 and even up to 80%. Um, our crop yields are similar to conventional crops. We use no, no insecticide, no fungicide um, as, as well, and no, and no ploughing. Sometimes small amounts of herbicides are used. We're not, we're not organic. Now, what that has done in many ways uh, is, um, in relation to soil, next, no, next, next slide please, Simon. Um, this, um, this photo, which is now probably, probably <laughs> fairly world famous, it's gone around the world a few times, is a photograph of my neighbouring place and um, a neighbour's place and mine. And um, this has been documented now by in the SCARP program. Um, Christine Jones, Dr Christine Jones and I also did measurements on here. Sydney University have done measurements on here. All these measurements are coming up very similar. The soil on Winona now has 204% more organic carbon. 
in a sequestered um, 46 tonne of carbon or 172 tonne of carbon dioxide per hectare over a 10 year period. It now holds 200% more water that, than, than the neighbouring place and all the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased, not decreased. Um, pH has changed from 5.6 to 6.1. Now, all of that is with, with reduced um, fertiliser, not increased fertiliser. It really is restoring the grassland that's driven all that. So the obvious question uh, that I get asked all the time, is this profitable? Um, now, annual costs at home, ha ha no, sorry, next slide up if you're up still with me there, Simon. Yep. Um, now, is it profitable? Annual cost savings, now we save $80,000 each year compared to when we were in, on, in home input agriculture. Uh, huge savings. Now, next slide, is it productive? Our annual income is higher. When owner now is running more sheep than it did before, Crop yields, and that, that, that relates to uh, higher, higher uh, wool, yield, wool yields or, uh, overall. Uh, crop yields are similar. We harvest and sell over a tonne and a thousand, thousand kilos of native grass feed a year. Soil organic carbon levels are increasing and all the nutrients are increasing. So, next slide. By managing agriculture and sound ecological principles together, and I can't emphasise ecological principles strongly enough, um, so by, by, by making agriculture and sound ecological principles, we can improve um, soil health um, and, 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 and um, water use efficiency. Um, we can increase nutrient cycling and availability. We can, we can also increase plant and animal diversity because we, we can restore grasslands. We can re, uh, fix plant and animal diseases. We just don't get any anymore. Like, for example, we don't use any insecticide. We haven't needed to use any insecticide for a bit about 15 years. Um, uh, we, uh, um, uh, we, we have uh, less, less plant and animal disease and we're far more profitable that, than we were previously. But in answer to do this, ne next slide, Simon. In, in, in order to do this, we really need agricultural practices to function closer to how nature had it originally designed. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, what I'd uh, just highlight for everyone there um, with the webinar is we can participate. So please ping your questions uh, to us as Cole um, was speaking. So as you think of them, we've got uh, Shane coming up now. So feel free, I'll be fielding them and that way we can then uh, have an efficient Q&A as well. Anyhow, so Cole, we very much appreciate your insights there and I'm sure there'll be useful of questions about the practicalities of what you've done. All right, with that in mind, let's skip now uh, up to, oh, come south to Theodore. Um, I noticed that some people say the slides aren't changing. You should, everyone should be seeing a slide of a harvester at the moment. Um, certainly at our end that's the case. Uh, perhaps if that's not right, someone can let me know. Anyhow, we're moving now to see uh, Shane's presentation. Stand by, we'll set up for that. At the end of Shane's, there'll be a, an online question for you to contemplate. So Shane, I hope you can hear us, uh, and I've got your first slide up. Yep, I'm, I'm here. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks Simon. Um, yeah, just, just some background, Shane and myself, uh, our property to explain is, is 30 kilometres south of Theodore in the southern Queensland Brigalow Belt. We run a, a herd of certified organic breeders and we fatten their progeny. Um, along with this we, we run non-certified beef cattle fattening, backgrounding and trading enterprises. The explain is, is 7,900 hectares in area. Um, but there's only 3,500 hectares that's usable for agriculture, with 300 metres above sea level and with a 700 millimetre annual rainfall. So if you can go to slide two, Simon. I'm there. Okay, right. At the, at the beginning when we came here, uh, it was fairly obvious in 1982 that soils and pastures were degraded. This was 
approximately 25 years after the Briglow stubs had been cleared. Timber regrowth was, was now abundant and we kind of sat down and had a look at it and we set ourselves a goal to, to get our soils in the best possible condition. <coughs> Move to slide three. Um, so where did we seek our advice? Um, I spent some time in a permaculture group in Nambour on the Sunshine Coast and started a, an education process based on reading um, the work of Bill Mollinson and permaculture, um, Fukuoka and the One Straw Revolution, Yeoman's Water for Every Farm and Alex Podlinski's Biodynamic Lectures. So we, we worked with these for some 10 years and then I attended the slide four song. I attended the Grazer for Profit workshop run by Resource Consulting Service presented by Stan Parsons and Terry McCosker. Further advice to this was received through attending other workshops put on by RCS, um, attending land care and other field days. So slide five, Simon. Um, what were the mistakes along the way? I guess the first big mistake was we did the conventional and started to re-clear the, the timber regrowth on the property. We've now got some interesting figures on the result of that. And over a over a 17, 16 year period, the country that we re-cleared is on average $21 per hectare gross margins less than the country that we left the regrowth on. So that was fairly sobering information. The other, the other big mistake we made in our property development was to do with installing new water systems. Um, I put in water systems without planning them. Uh, these have proven to be quite inadequate and we've been faced with the cost of, of redoing some of those systems to get them up to speed. We go to slide six, Simon. Yep, and can you just speak up a little bit, Shane? Thank you. Okay, right. Is that better? That's wonderful. Right. I'll just get away from the phone a little bit. <laughs> so that brings us to, in what we've done, in this quest to get our soils in best possible condition, what are the things that have worked really well? One of the last things we came to doing was was to do with using the biodynamic methodologies. Um, and I guess my experience with that is that if I started all over again, that would be the first thing I'd use rather than the last. We've had the fortune to good fortune to work with other farmers in our area and using the biodynamic preparations and we've seen results in six months um, that have given a better result than it took us three years to achieve where we were not using the preparations. So the potential to actually shorten time frames with improving soil. <coughs> the next one was, was cell grazing. Um, so if we can put up slide seven, on we introduced cell grazing in 1993, uh, and this is yeah, this really contributed to speeding up the changes we we're already seeing. This slide you'll see is a Euclid woodland that's never been cleared, and this is actually now on those data we gave you with the um, yields of the paddocks. This is some $19 less in gross margins than the, the beautiful scrub country that we re-cleared. So again, quite sobering. The, the normal procedure in this country up here is to go through and clear all the trees off it. This to me is one of the healthiest ecosystems we've got on the property because it's never really had its integrity challenged. 
Now with better management in the cell, we're just seeing improvements every year, and I'm predicting this country will get up in production to where our scrub country is. Um, slide eight, Simon. Okay. Yeah. So this is another. This is a semi-evergreen vine thicket or our softwood scrub country with regrowth on it. The other thing that has worked really well for us is monitoring. So we've now got 18 years of, of yield data to work with in, in our future developments of the property. And when we started collecting this data, we were six months into it, we were able to demonstrate that paddocks like this with timber in them were out yielding the paddocks that we'd recleared. Slide nine. Okay. This, is, this, this is Brigalow regrowth. Um, if you're not familiar with Brigalow, the general mindset with Brigalow is you can't grow grass underneath it. I think we've successfully disproven that theory. So the monitoring is, is, is one of the things that was probably the hardest for us to do. Uh, but we found it has been extremely effective in terms of it, uh, our decision making processes. So then what are the benef benefits that we've attained from the, I guess, the quest to get our soils in best possible condition? So our, our carrying capacity pretty much now is matching the carrying capacity of the country when the scrub was first cleared. Quite, it's quite common in this area for, for carrying capacity to actually reduce to half what it was. Water use efficiency, a better use of rainfall. We're getting, we're getting more grass growth, more grazing days per millimetre of rain than is, than is the normal accepted around here. The thing that's been really effective is our growing season is getting longer and our, our dry season getting shorter. Pasture health. We look at a lot of the root depth of our plants and a couple of years ago we were doing work with an excavator and we were siding plant roots down to 1.7 metres in the soil profile. So we're, we're farming in a hell of a lot more soil than we were when we came back here in 1982. This root depth is, is helping with, with water infiltration when we get rainfall and through the last three years with some quite extreme rainfall events, we've got country here that's not running any water. So we're sitting around waiting for dams to fill and all the water's just going into the soil profile. Obviously along with this is, is soil structure has improved. Again, in, and in line with what Cole was talking about, we've got more diversity, diversity in fauna and flora. <clears throat> our ease of stock handling, because our animals are seeing us up generally every second day to be moved to fresh paddocks, they become really friendly and easy to handle and it's, it's quite easy to, to handle mobs of six, seven, eight hundred head of cattle with one person and, and bring them into the cattle yards and take them back out to paddocks. Now, financially, the big one is reduced cost of production. We're basically running this place now with, with little or no outside inputs. All our fertility inputs, the biodynamic preparations are all made on farm from plants on farm. The other big one for the, for the people in the business is a yeah, lot less stress. So when we get drought here and we sell cattle, we get the opportunity to go to the beach instead of feeding instead of feeding animals or checking waters. So slide 11, Simon, will go on to the what I see as the, the take home messages 
from what we've learned here is use the biodynamic preparations first up. Planning and monitoring. So planning as in the water systems, planning in the, the development of the property. We saw a lot of developments in the land care days and then through the cell grazing developments where people worked on unproductive land to try and get an increase in production. Now if you get a 100% increase of production of zero or for zero production level, you haven't got much. So planning, and we did a lot of work in our most productive country and did our developments there first, and they gave us a return. By the time we got to the degraded areas, they'd probably healed themselves more or less that we didn't have to spend money there. It's important for everybody in the business to commit to the change. Um, <clears throat> if you've got members in the business or staff that are against what you're doing, then it is a, an uphill battle. So it's good to have everybody singing the same tune. The other thing I'm coming up against a lot with working with other people is transitioning. If you're transitioning from a chemical agricultural system uh, to a more biological, to where you want to improve the, the condition of the soils, then it's not a good idea to go cold turkey. It puts you a business at huge financial risk. While you're learning to, to work a new system, I advise people now to carry on business as usual and introduce a new system and then gradually wean themselves off the old one. By the time they're fully weaned, then they're, they're very fluent with the new system and they don't go through the, the financial trauma. That's all for me. Thanks, Simon. Wonderful. Thanks, Shane. And uh, congratulations to Shan for her uh, stunning photographs as well in the Women's Weekly and also the story that's been told there. Um, we, we've got now, uh, you know, a, ample time for some questions so please uh, please come through with your questions and and Brett's been fielding a lot of them and scooping them up but I think what we might do is just start with one whilst we've got Shane handy there a couple of people have been asking um, about okay well what's actually in these biodynamic preparations because people aren't familiar with them at all so Shane, just while you're pondering that question, you know we're after a, a relatively simple answer and that can be expanded upon perhaps. But for everyone, uh, both Cole and Shane's uh, case studies produced by Source for Life are sitting on our website at sourceforlife.org.au. So uh, you can always go back and have a read of them as well. But whilst we've got the two gentlemen here, we might as well make the most of the question. So the first one to you, Shane, and then we'll, we'll run to a survey question. The first one to you is, you know, what basically goes into these biodynamic preparations, please? Yes, yeah, Simon, the, the biodynamic preparations are primarily uh, fresh cow manure, um, ground up silica, uh, the, the, the cow manure, the, the most known biodynamic preparation is, is VD500 or horn manure, which is fresh cow manure that's put into a, a cow horn and buried over the winter. The silica, ground up silica is a, known as horn silica or preparation 501. It's put into a cow horn and buried over the summer. The other preparations are, there's half a dozen compost preparations that are made out of different herbs and they all have a function in activating different elements, be it calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, etc. And, and the, the compost preparations actually work in digestion and decomposition. So the way I'll look at the, the whole spectrum is the horn manure works downwards through the soil, the horn silica works upwards, and the, the compost preparations work in the middle, they're the stomach. So it's kind of like a cow, you've got food going in one end, being digested and coming out the other. I can expand on that further in a text, but yeah, for now that's, that probably covers it as briefly as I can. All right, and that's well done. Thanks, Shane. Uh, just a little follow-on whilst I've got the floor is, um, how do you actually distribute these biodynamic preparations? Because I think you use a slightly different method to perhaps some others. 
Yeah, there's a lot of different methodologies. There's, there's mixing them with water and spraying them out. That's virtually impossible in most of our landscape here. Uh, we now use two methods of getting them out, and one is primarily through stock water. Uh, so we introduce a, a tea bag with the preparations into the stock trough, so when the cattle drink, it infuses into the water, it goes through the animal, the animal then becomes the tractor. The other methodology we use is a, an energetic methodology which is known as radionics and we use what, what are called field broad, broadcaster towers. Uh, thanks Shane. Uh, just briefly, there's also just a couple of questions. I don't think we uh, gave people a good idea of where your property actually is located. Yeah, we're, we're due west of Bundaberg, about 250 kilometres and south of Brockhampton or a little southwest of Brockhampton, the same distance, about 250 kilometres. The, thank you. Uh, getting a few questions in, particularly uh, to both Cole and Shane, how, how have you actually measured um, change or progress within your system? Who do you want to answer that? Uh, well, uh, we get Cole first and Shane, thank you. Um, the way I've monitored at home, we, we started, to start with, there's been a lot of research work um, done by universities and CSIRO at home, um, but I have nine 100 uh, metre transects, which is a, 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 a point in paddocks that we that twice a year I um, monitor plant counts on it, on uh, every metre along that line, and also ground cover and, and things like that, so I can see changes. Uh, uh, over time, um, and, and that's shown that we've increased in the in the time since I changed, which is sort of 20 years, uh, the perennial species from nine to over 60 now uh, over the farm. So, and, and that's from our monitoring points. Um, we're doing regular carbon testing as well. So, uh, measuring carbon can be an indicator that things are hang, uh, heading in the right direction. Um, uh, so, yeah, the place at home is, is monitored pretty well. Thanks, Cole. Shane? Yeah, uh, soil testing with a focus on soil organic matter um, and, and phyto and grass check sites similar to what Cole's talking about. They're, they're a triangle of a 100 metre equilateral triangle. Um, I do a lot of monitoring the soil just by using a shovel, getting a handful of soil, and smelling it. Um, looking at grass species and diversity in pasture, uh, looking at wildlife and uh, in particular birds and looking at the diversity in species. So I work a lot on, on the visual and, and getting out and walking on the soil and what it feels like. Um, I don't rely a lot on the, the scientific side of the, the soil testing type thing. Uh, I'm probably working very much in a um, intuitive mode rather than a, than a reduction science mode. But the other thing, the big one is our production levels. We uh, cost of production and, and our actual production levels over time. And just so, thanks very much Shane, and just for people that probably may not be familiar with the sort of country Shane comes from, very much an extensive grazing system, so uh, some, some complementary approaches there. Uh, to both Cole and Shane, we've had um, a few questions in really about how long did it take for you to start seeing changes in your system and one specific one, if I can get Shane to answer that first and then Cole, there was a specific one in, to you about uh, how long did it take you to achieve a 20% increase in soil carbon, if I'm reading uh, the percentages here correct. 200. 200, sorry. Simon's writing is even worse than mine. <laughs> Sorry, so uh, Shane, would just, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a feel for how long it took for you to start seeing changes in, in your system? How long? We spent, we spent the first 10 years basically working in the dark with no, no, nobody to compare with, with what we were doing. Uh, it was in 1993 when we did the Grazing for Profit workshop that we actually started to get some things to do some measuring and, and we actually we did start monitoring then. So we saw changes in those first 10 years and, and it was a little bit like watching paint fade. Um, and since then the, the change has become really obvious and 
yeah, like living in this landscape now is just, it's magnificent looking across the country. It's, it's so soft and we're getting a lot of comments from, from neighbouring places. They say, oh, your property's still green uh, when, when a lot of other countries drying off. So yeah, the, the, big, the big results when we went cell grazing, it takes, you get, it, you get an impact straight away but it, it's about five years before you see some real results happening when you go into cell grazing. With biodynamics, we're, we're witnessing big change in, in as little as five and a half months. Thanks, Shane. And Cole? Yeah, in relation to, to change, uh, um, uh, again, it was slow because what I was doing was developing something totally new and different that no one had ever, ever done before. And, of course, everyone thought I was a lunatic. Um, so I, I had no help other than Dr. Christine Jones. Chris has always been a great supporter, and so Chris was the main the main person, as well of, of course as Daryl Clough. So Dar Cloughy and I, we we spent a lot of time uh, working this out together, um, but two lunatics together, I guess. But Christine was a great help in this. But a bit bit similar. To, uh, initially, the, the the change is slow, especially when you make mistakes along the way, trying to develop something. Um, but now, um, it, 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 because there's a lot of adoption of this around Australia and around the world, you see the results easily in two to three years. And, and in, as far as improving grassland goes, um, after a paddock's been pasture cropped, uh, you'll see um, uh, plant recruitment, young, young plants growing along the drill lines uh, within 12 months or within that first, that first um, season. Um, so it can be it, it, um, it, it can be reasonably quick, um, but with me it happened a, a, a slower because I was making mistakes along the way, developing stuff. Um, again, I think that five year uh, 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 time frame is interesting in, in relation to carbon building. The um, uh, it seems to be a three to five year lag time um, it, because you've got to improve soil structure and get everything functioning before you start to see increase in carbon. Um, um, the other question that I was asked, a 200%, Simon, do you want me to answer that one now? Yes, please. A 200% increase in carbon. Those tests were done, that was over about a 10 year period uh, that, uh, uh, in that, that particular area that we were monitoring and, and um, where a lot of the data has been collected. So it was a 200% increase or 172 tonne per hectare of carbon dioxide uh, sequestered was over a 10 year period. Uh, to both Cole and Shane again, uh, we've had a number of questions really around if you could just give three points each about what, are, what three major changes have you made. Uh, a few people have, um, are still looking for a bit more clarity in what changes you've made from what you were doing to what you are doing. So Shane, if you could um, give us three, probably the, the top three things that you've changed on your property. Yeah, stop clearing the trees and let the trees grow back. Um, Change the grazing system and use the biodynamics. Thank you. And Cole? Stop using uh, fertiliser, as in superphosphate. It was the first thing I did in 1980. Um, restored the grassland. Uh, and restored, uh, I mean, um, for, I restored a grassland from a pasture. Big difference. In, in a pasture, especially an introduced pasture, this is now native grassland at home, 80% perennial species there. Um, and, and I guess the other, the other couple of changes is change, change to pasture cropping and, and, and grazing management, a, a similar, very similar to what Shane has done in grazing management, with, but I've had the addition of pasture cropping in it. Uh, thank you. And also a couple of questions to both speakers around um, relating to uh, retaining more uh, trees and vegetation. Have you noticed that the uh, pasture species uh, dry off uh, later or earlier in those systems where you're retaining more vegetation? And um, uh, have you seen any negative implications associated with retaining more vegetation? Uh, Cole? Well, first thing we need to realise is that plants are the drivers of soil health. So we need more plants, not less. Um, and I'm relating more to a grassland at the moment. but. Uh, the more species we have in a grassland, the, the, the better it, it will function. 
But that can also include trees. Like for example, we've I've planted about 15,000, 20,000 trees at home, many paddock trees as well. So a grassland also uh, encompasses uh, uh, trees as well. Uh, so yes, all vegetation need to increase. And not only when you get more species, more plant species, you'll actually see a, a greater window of green growth outside the, the dry period. Um, so you'll produce more more feed. It'll just drive itself. Real simple stuff. Thank you. And Shane? Yeah, with 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 the when I when I drive around this property now and look at the the grass is starting to hay off. Um, where we've got no trees, the grass is hayed off. Where we've got trees, the grass is still green. When as we get into winter and start getting frost, we've got country that used to frost heavily. Um, it's not frosting now under the trees, so we've got green grass there right through the winter. At times I see the trees competing with the grass for moisture. Uh, this tends to be more on our heavy clay soils and I think part of that is that these heavy clay soils still have not regained their, their health. Their, they still don't have the organic matter they should have. But yeah, it's when you look at the production figures that we've got now in relation to our trees, where we've got the most trees, we've got the best production. So without visually looking at the grass, just looking at those production figures, it's, it's, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Like trees are a hell of an advantage in a landscape. And one of the things that happened up here with the trees, they've done trials. Tree, grass around trees is higher in protein as a result of more nitrogen in the system. And under in a continuous grazing system, the animals really hammer that grass under the trees and weaken it, take it back, and you end up with bare dirt. And that's Queensland tree science why we cleared all the trees off our country was because they saw the tree as the enemy, and it was the grazing system that was the actual enemy. Thanks, Shane. I'll just hand over to Simon. But just a reminder to people, we will get a. Uh, individual replies back to all of your questions. So thanks very much for getting them in and Simon. Okay, and one's just come in, Shane, whilst we got you there, you're talking about your, your clay soils um, and in some instances haven't regenerated. How did you go about regenerating the clay soils where you have been successful? <laughs> the, probably the, the ultimate Rolls-Royce treatment was in our garden and I dug in charcoal and compost and, and I've seen that, like I had it friable down to the full depth of a digging fork and over the last three years with heavy rainfall we've totally lost all that and it's gone back packed hard clay again. So I love sandy soils. <laughs> I've developed a little bit of a hatred for the heavy clays because they are difficult to work with, they're really slow to change and where we thought we had the tiger by the tail these high rainfall years have just consumed all that organic matter and it's gone away again. Mm. So it's a, a constant challenge to work on those soils. So take that point home. Uh, there's a simple one for you, Shane. Um, do you use fire to support the management on your property at all? Absolutely. Fire is always a tool. Uh, and the best fire is putting the grass through the inside of a cow and letting the cow burn the grass up. If we do, our eucalypt country is subject to, to wildfires. Um, if we get a fire through any of our country, we subsequently lock it up for the full growing season after the fire. And, and fire can be a great mechanism for getting change in, in pasture composition and, and move the, the thing forward. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a rule of thumb. If we get a fire through any country, we lock it up for a full growing season to let the, the change happen properly. The, normal thing up here with fire is people graze straight on top of the fire and that's the greatest way to take your pastures backwards and we're witnessing up here monocultures of African love grass in the Euclid country to the east of us as a result of fire and constant grazing. Okay, thank you. Cole, I hope you're still there up Mariva. Yep, still here. Okay, so we'll get to a couple of, a lot of fundamental questions for both of you. The first one for you Cole is how well does pasture cropping work as a system when, for example, rainfall occurs mostly in winter as opposed to sort of summery 
uh, falls and the likes. Now, I know you travel all around the country uh, talking about pasture cropping and training people up, so you should be well placed to answer that question for us. Yep, yep, that's not a problem. Um, uh, if you've got very much dominant wind, uh, say, uh, winter rainfall, uh, can still work really well. Um, I do a lot of work in, in uh, uh, Victoria. It does work very well there also. Um, West Australia, pasture cropping is working very well in West Australia they're, they're, where there's um, um, sowing into subtropicals, introduced subtropicals like green panic, uh, those species, rose grass, those species, um, working very well in West Australia, getting good yields, um, helping uh, building soils very rapidly. So it, it does work, work well. Um, you have to have enough rainfall to be able to grow the, the, the crop. But the other alternative uh, too is you can switch it around if you uh, to to um, uh, you, you can grow something in the summer or the winter as as well depending on you know what species you're sowing into. All right, wonderful. And so come back to a fundamental question then now for Shane and biodynamics, and and I'm sort of um, modifying the question that someone asked, but you know biodynamics is it more about attitude or is it underpinned by science? It depends on what sort of science, uh, but it is. It's a lot. It's a lot about attitude or intention. Uh, I think anything in agriculture is dependent on on what your attitude or your intention is. It's a, that intention is a great driver of of the outcomes. So if you're if you go into something like biodynamics and and in the back of your head it says oh this this is won't work, then that's the result you'll get. But if you go into any any system and say this is going to work, then you're guaranteed to, to have success. But there is there is science to back up biodynamics, uh, Newtonian reductionist type science that will back up some of the stuff in biodynamics. But it's, it's fairly thin on the ground because most most scientific research like that is is funded by the petrochemical companies. Yeah. Okay. Well done, thank you for that. And, and just a quick fire uh, one to finish up. You, you producing uh, obviously uh, beef off your property. Are you finding that there is a market for uh, chemical free uh, beef where you are? All of our production goes straight to America. Uh, we did kill some of our early stuff into the domestic market, but the domestic market was flooded by existing producers. We only got in a window when there was a lot of rain and nobody could get stock out. So basically we're producing straight into the American market. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. Well, we might leave the questions there. I know there's still a few uh, out there, but some of them perhaps could be best answered by uh, Cole and by Shane, just uh, using our format where we'll answer them as quickly as possible and then we'll have them sat on the Land Care and the Source for Life website where they'll sit there, a great resource. And just a reminder to people that the questions and answers provided by David Marsh uh, and by Mike Grundy from last week's uh, are now sitting on those websites. Really valuable resource and you're most welcome to them and spread them as far and as wide as you see fit. So I'll ask Brett now to uh, uh, get ready for winding up and then I'll speak about next week. Thanks very much, Simon. And yes, the, uh, that's soilsforlife.com.au. .org.au, sorry. And mine's uh, landcarefacilitator.com.au. We've got, uh, sorry, just before I move on to a final question, uh, just a reminder that uh, what we're trying to do over these three weeks is have a range of different presenters with different perspectives uh, so that people can take what they want in a bit of a shopping expedition. It's certainly not intended from any of our speakers to be sort of my way or the highway. There are a range of perspectives that uh, our speakers are kindly sharing with people and uh, the viewers will take from it what their different circumstances are with a country this large, very different farming systems, different climatic systems. Uh, we're finding that people are, are just happy to, to listen to a range of different speakers and then make, draw their own conclusions. So that's certainly all we can hope for people. Uh, we've got one final poll question, if we could ask people to participate, please, if we could get that last question up, thanks. And for those who have begun to introduce some changes on their properties or been involved with changes, um, 
could you click on one or a number of what you've seen have been the major benefits either on your place or changes that you've helped to introduce on other properties? Uh, again, you can tick one or more of these. This is just to give us a, an idea of um, you know, what people think they, they're getting from, from change that they've either implemented or, or helped to bring about. So it's quite an interesting spread that we're seeing there on the screen right across the, the spectrum. We'll just give that a, another couple of moments. And we might uh, shut that one off if we could, thank you. Well, thank you very much again for everyone's participation. Uh, Simon said we will have uh, not only the questions and answers uh, out to everyone who's participated in the near future, but they'll also be up on our respective websites. And everyone who's been involved today uh, that's registered will also get sent a link for the recording and the PowerPoint presentations. And I'll get Simon to introduce next week's speakers, please. Right. OK. So uh, we heard both from Shane and from uh, Cole today about the importance of measurement and monitoring. You know, how do we know we're doing the right things? How do we know we're trending in the right direction? And if we get these things right, hopefully we're out there measuring leading indicators uh, as well as lag so we can sort of start being proactive as opposed to reactive with what we do out there in the landscapes. So in many ways, that's what we're going to be talking about next week. And we're fortunate to have Tim Wright uh, from up around uh, Urella Way uh, who will talk to us about what he's introduced. Now, another grazing system, but it's different from what you've uh, heard before. And Tim's had a lot of science run over the top of his property. And so we'll learn a lot from Tim and his approach there to measuring and monitoring. And we've also got uh, Rhonda and Bill Daly from uh, outside of Young. They've got a mixed enterprise in their part of Australia and uh, Rhonda is a, a tour de force on all things soils uh, and uh, how to improve them in, in quite difficult situations and Rhonda can give you uh, great detail on how about going with measurement, how to read your measurements and then also how to monitor what you're doing in terms of improvement. So they're our two key speakers for next week which will wrap up our series on soil health in this first uh, group of uh, webinars. We look forward to you uh, participating and again if people have missed uh, for whatever reason your mates and the likes earlier webinars it's still uh, time to register for next week so I encourage you to pass that on. And thank you very much to our speakers today both Cole and Shane for your, your time and experience and it's uh, goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him. Okay. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you Ronnie. Thank you. Ta.